Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's really nice to take you into a tour uh, in sustainability analytics at Inca Group, which is the largest IKEA retailer. Sustainability analytics is a super version of understanding the business. It is like bringing a long-term mindset into the traditional business analysis, which is usually focusing on only the outputs. This is actually my invitation to you to transform your data analysis job and to replace it with a mission. A mission by putting positive impact in its core for a healthier and greener planet. So let's dive right into what is sustainable mobility, why it matters, and how we get there. Measuring the environmental footprint of omnichannel retail is essential to our society. It informs and frames our everyday decisions as citizens, customers, and also businesses and employees. Technology and e-commerce infused cons consumer habits change the retail market, as we all know. We are part of it, right? We kind of grew up like that. Even though it happened without fully understanding the scale or the actual meaning of home delivery, how things are getting to us when we order them. Measuring the pollution emitted by business transactions like, trans like deliveries, uh, it's not a voluntary act anymore. Governments require compliance, better action plans, and also greater transparency and you know disclosures many times. Companies should act now and they have to test and scale transforming their business, thinking much stronger on long-term distance, long-term uh, time planning, then ecological and social outcomes are coming to play, then the really short-term financial outputs. And this is who we are in, in IKEA. We have a strategy called People Planet Positive, which we launched almost 10 years ago. And we have an ambitious goal to transform our entire business, the industries connected to our value chain and also the urban realities of our customers, people every day. Um, and we do this work all around the world in 30 markets in almost uh, 400 stores and also, of course, many more city center locations where you might have seen us already showing up. So let's jump in. First, of course, we talk about urbanization because we all live in cities. I assume most of you live in cities because we all, most of us live in cities. It changed a lot since uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Our economic pursuit, resource use and rapid urbanization moving into cities has really left a permanent mark on the planet. The pace is remarkable. Um, just about 200 years ago, we barely lived in, in the settlements that were city-like. City but nowadays, the space that we have is one of the, the sickest resource that we have around us. Cities and urban places now occupy the center stage on global development, but they don't, they don't, they don't or they no longer function as mere settlements, locations for services or goods um, or production. Uh, if you consider about half of the population of the world already lives in cities, uh, urban areas, you could call, um, out of that 1.6 billion actually live in locations where they are uh, exposed to water shortages, uh, severe weather conditions or uh, pollution. If you consider that 20 years ago, the world population was about 6, 6 billion people. In 20 years time, that will be the amount of people living in cities. So the impact we have on cities and what we do in it is really remarkable and really significant. Our ecosystem is really interdependent. I know you don't, I don't need to explain that to you. The rapid change that we do in cities have a really strong, strong pressure on the city systems, which means the energy grids, the actual water infrastructure, the transport infrastructure, all the food supplies and also the waste management. If you walk around and if I'm pretty sure you try to do during the COVID pandemic lockdowns, you probably notice that quite some space is actually covered in urban areas by uh, transportation uh, infrastructure, per primary roads. It's about 30 to 60% uh, of the actual space. And I'm pretty sure you also adopted to behaviors during the, uh, the pandemic, looking for, uh, in a way, meeting your demands, your needs without physical interaction. We also shifted certain paradigms, how we think about basic concepts, how we think about what is essential work how we actually keep business running, a city run, fulfillment run, without actually, you know, some of us stays at home and some others are out there doing that for us. It is really interesting to start talking about the challenge, how to make an urbanization, urban reality sustainable. And I'm pretty sure that you, um, you have thoughts about that already. I think it's really possible to make that change if we put our mind into it. If we really become stewards of people and planet and putting purpose before the profit, Essentially, profit will come if you take care of that first two people and planet. Decisions shall be made with all stakeholders in, in, uh, involved and also affected, which also means, of course, consumers, retailers, communities, competitors. 
their collaboration is key in determining which business model will be actually sustainable for all of us. And this is where we have a possibility to change. If you consider that the human progress where we came from, uh, how we measured ourselves was usually measured by index by the ease and the speed of our mobility. If you consider that we measured our capacity, how we are, how we are actually moving people and goods on your feet, two feet walking around, riding an animal, a horse, driving a car, flying across the uh, continents. In the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century in America, you were able to order an actual family house, a six bedroom, two floor house through a catalog that was delivered to you in a railroad card box. Sounds pretty amazing, right? Those houses still standing. It was really simple to say, I have a need, I need to get it met. And there was an actual retailer who helped me to get that done. And it was living with me for a long time, serving me for a long time. The catalog, of course, was giving you choices. What was really the difference afterwards, expanding this choice is e-commerce provided you an opportunity to also um, compress, in some ways, compress the time, how long it takes for you to get fulfilled. We were able to have the um, have everything on our fingerprints or on our keyboards before. Uh, this, of course, brought the instant gratification, the need to deliver it as fast as possible as a compet competitive edge. Essentially, the product itself were not as important than the actual moment. How quickly does it get to you? Um, this, of course, is the moment where you consider whether previously shipping was not free and now it became free. Well, shipping is never free. It is just built into the prices, but the mental push, the behavior incentives on the customers really comes into play how they see this shipping and delivery itself. The moment where you say today, how we measure human progress is actually measuring immobility. The fact that we are sitting and ordering something and someone else brings it to us. This and how long, of course, it takes for them to get it to us. And I think this is the moment where retail is really an interesting area to be in today because omnichannel retail is really giving you personal purchase journeys. And this is the moment where you have the dopamine coming into play. And also a little bit, you would say, in a reality that interferes with common sense. And sometimes you could say that's uh, an actual uh, driving you to addiction. Um, the point where it's really interesting is the seamless appearance of a box at your doorstep, which gives you this side effect that you actually disconnect the purchase from the delivery. That's the moment where we disconnect the buyer from the actual human effort to get things to your doorstep. It just magically happens that it shows up there. This is the moment where you consider the fees that I was referring to, the shipping fees. There are always costs associated to getting things delivered. Some of them you might know, and some of them might just occur today because you know there's a long term to, to really show what it actually means as a cost. There was a lot of attention paid recently on uh, the effect, the impact of um, warehouse workers and delivery uh, drivers, how they actually get things done, get work done, especially during the pandemic, this was in, in, uh, in full attention. There is, of course, the moment where you say that the faster pace and the faster volume of delivery that we need, demand, require, order, it puts a lot of pressure on these systems that I talked about, the infrastructure, the cities, and also on companies itself. And this is where it comes to sustainable mobility, what it actually means to make the mobility that we do, transporting people and, and goods from A to B, to really make it sustainable. Um, and you, you probably wonder, there is no better time to think about the, the mobility is a need today. Everyone wants to get from A to B, get something fast done, travel and see parents, fly over and have a, have a trip somewhere. How we do this, how sustainably are we doing this, meaning how much damage are we doing? Why we are moving things A to B or travel from A to B? It's really important because we might hinder someone else's opportunity years later who absolutely not connected to our needs today, but we need to think about them when we are doing this. And this of course means we need to rethink how we are actually ordering, living our lives, getting our needs met and how we are actually operating as businesses. Considering that Transportation is quite a significant contributor to the uh, air pollution around us, or the cars or the vehicles or the energy consumption. You probably wonder how you are actually able to mitigate that, how you are actually able to change that. And hopefully within your company, you already started making steps for that. The overall goal for our society is to really to minimize and mitigate the neg negative impact. And of course, this is the point where it's a responsibility and a business opportunity as well making sure that sustainable, that uh, mobility is sustainable uh, and also plays into energy transition, which is how we use energy, how we source energy. 
Just think about a car that you might have that you changed into an EV or potentially you get changed into an EV, electric vehicle, or anything else that will come as next generation opportunity to move around. Think about investments into public transportation or just a better opportunity to get around when you're cycling and not actually taking your car. This is the point where I'm, I must say that the actual environmental impact of omnichannel retail is still unclear. It's a developing field, you might say. Hence, it is every company's responsibility to actually inquire which is the most sustainable way to fulfill their customers' needs, meaning most sustainable as the least polluting. So we are zooming into last mile and I'm conscious of time. This is the point I know that you uh, you all familiar that last mile is an obsession. It's a differentiator, it's an actual disruptor. Day-to-day -day activities, you wonder, it's actually one of the most expensive parts of the journey as the product travels around. It's also the most polluting. Average distance, you would say, customer travels uh, 20, 20 to 70 kilometer. The product itself might travel the same way, but it's a, it has a really, really stronger footprint. A point where you are thinking in forward thinking companies that there is a challenge between a normal conflict between the environmental conscious ways of doing things and the financially most viable way of doing things. This is not a, let's say, opposing opinion. This is a win-win if you turn them hand in hand into, a, into an opportunity. It really takes a, a big tent collaboration. It takes a lot of effort internally, new thinking, redesigning processes to actually make change happen. And this is where IKEA really started working early on to demand new ways of working, demand uh, manufacturers producing actual vehicles that are helping us to convert, to fit our products, to making sure actual products are designed in you know, sustainable and affordable manners, making it accessible to people who might choose uh, other products that might not be as sustainable and also making it an affordable way. This is the moment where the uh, long-term, of course, the compression comes into play. It's a retailer's dilemma. How do you compete in this market? You can't get things instantly in 15 minutes to the door. That's not necessarily the competitive edge anymore. The comp competitive edge is that long longevity, you would say, the long-term thinking. When you know you think the right way, not only doing that the fastest way. And I think this is the moment where we are all responsible to encourage behaviors that are not destructive on the long term, including in last my delivery. And this is where I invite you to think outside of the blue box and blue box meaning that's how we call our stores, blue box. I do believe we are all empowered to make more sustainable choices as customers, service providers, and also businesses. We can and we should inform and encourage our customers to make the greener choice. And sometimes that's the, that's the fastest delivery. It might be a slow commerce, meaning the products actually takes a little time to get to your door, but it gets to your door with the best opportunity or the best option in transportation. This is the point where conscious consumption is usually mentioned when we are thinking about individual needs versus the community's needs. And this is the point, of course, where you say we think about meaningful opportunities, employments, work conditions that we don't want anyone to break themselves to get the products to us. We want the product itself to be, you know, arriving safely and securely. And also, of course, a product I really need. And I'm asking, but I'm inviting you to think outside of the box. And in case, of course, it means thinking beyond just the basic transactions that you are thinking in business. We talk about a symphony with a lot of orchestra components. We talk about fuel types and vehicles and distances and work schedules and actual emission factors associated to every passenger kilometer taken by the vehicles. Efficiency, traffic, no one is at home, second attempt delivery, returns, lead time, city regulations, EV range, there's a lot of instruments that part play into this, into this uh, whole game. But of course, I don't want you to think about data yet. I want you to think about as a decision driven thinking, think about a phenomenon and also think about your audience. Considering that every retailer's major footprint that they are controlling the closest is related to their transportation, even, even for those who don't talk about it. This is the moment where of course the problem turns, a challenge turns into an opportunity. Two, two, two reasons why it's most important, because the high cost and the high, high environmental footprint. And of course, the moment where you say you want to deliver value to your audience, you need to make sure that you ask the right questions. And a lot of questions, not only about data, what is motivating them, why they actually want to get this done. And also consider that they might make decisions that you are feeding with information and you want to turn that around. You want to steer their decisions with your data and steering them towards greener opportunities. 
Um, this is, of course, the moment where you really have to do the basics well before you would jump into any advanced work. Measure, disclose, target, and adjust, and act, of course, every time in a loop because you need to reduce the, uh, the impact by test and learn. And sometimes you need to test and learn before you're able to scale to something faster or bigger. And that's why I usually say start small and smart, um, because that's the point that you say you need to think holistically. You need to start thinking on what does it mean and where you will start going into the data points. Small and wide data is usually the point where I'm starting. Thinking about mobility as a phenomenon, system dynamics, because that's more than just a transaction itself and someone taking from A to B, driving from A to B. This is the moment where you say the space shapes transport as much as transport shapes space. We ponder a lot about unknowns instead of the knowns because we need to know the things that we haven't been looked at first. Sometimes it might be the data not captured, which is the reality in any data science. Your data might exist being captured, but it's actually present in those spaces where transfer happens. So think holistically, look wide first and then dive, deep dive into it. And that's the moment where I'm talking about the echo, the negative presence of data. I'm always looking for building new data sets, new data points, thanks to that. Discovering new knowledge through those that I might have missed, but actually exist as a phenomenon. And this is the point where you're bringing footprint and actual reality, the impact itself next to the cost. You bring in more features of the cost that you might not seen before. And it also helps you to spot and reuse bias in your data. So yeah, the point where the uh, the actual spatial analysis comes into play and presentation is, as you hear, it's really long um, because you really need to start thinking before you visualizing it. You need to know the audience because then they will be able to relate to whatever you will put in front of them. This is the point where logistics and behavioral variables come together as a root cause to understand what's the reason for that high cost and what's the reason for that high environmental footprint. And I'm always considering the basics when I'm starting visualizing in, uh, yeah, this is ArcGIS, ArcGIS, depending on how you pronounce it, um, because there are a few number of factors that are constraining this reality, the space, as I referred before. I'm merging the outside and the outside in and the inside out. That's the point where you have to actually bring in the game changers next to your business transaction data that you always track, that you always follow and most likely able to influence the best the capacity, the order and, and delivery orchestration, the precision, the lead time, the average speed, the distance, the catchment area, when you are able to see urban or rural orders, and also any rest time needed for the actual range that you need uh, to get things done delivered. The ins outside in is itself where you have influence, and that's, as I referred, the design thinking game changer opportunity. When you bring in the emission factors related to those vehicles, when you bring in traffic congestion, you bring in the actual adherence to the delivery plan, meaning there was something planned, did it actually happen in the real time? When you bring in fair workforce remuneration, the actual opportunity for having the workforce you need, the concentration of the orders, the order customer interactions, or any rerouting opportunity or need. This is the moment where I always connect on visual way. I connect the layers on business and impact. Connecting those dots you would seek for uh, in heat maps and really helps you to rethink and actually open new opportunities for fulfillment. I think the moment where I will almost close is just to say that storytelling is the journey. This is not the destination because the destination itself is that sustainable future that we talk about, that urban reality. And I really have to be frank and honest, last mile in that sense in the sustainable journey is really still a pain point for many of the companies because it's the moment you need to make serious decisions about who you are as a brand and how you actually meet your customer as you've done before in a brick and mortar store. This is the point you don't look at process itself as op optimizing or efficiency or effectiveness only. You think about the impact it's how it has on a longer term, which probably more than one tertial or one quarter or one year. The near future climate models show that the exponential increase of delivery vehicles, emitted pollution and congestion will just make our life more, let's say, difficult in cities. And this is a responsibility on the actual public um, cities, public entities and private companies to collect an abundant amount of data and share it in between to know how we are able to tackle this problem together. The problem is usually not the data, but the analysis on top of it where you're able to derive insights that are actionable, where you're actually able to build a baseline and also help cross-sector collaboration because it's a shared mission, right? Uh, the measuring the impact itself 
and adopting to the new ways to meet the customers and hence meeting us because we are also their customers, right? So I'm almost on the point. I'm just sharing our founders, um, let's say one of the quote, the, uh, the example itself that I try to bring to you as how we do it, probably starting more in the theory than the practice part, but I think, I, I think you know where I'm coming from. Um, this is the point where sharing what we do and how we do, and also any brand who wants to do with us, we are happy to join, join forces. Um, and I think that's the, that's the best, best moment before I'm opening for questions that uh, you are really able to start thinking what is the best example you have internally that you could also share, not only with us, but further inside your own, uh, in your own circles, in your own uh, team that you can bring in to find solutions, opportunities, because there are no silver, silver lining here or breakthroughs. There are in incremental changes that you're able to do. And of course, as some technology or a new vehicle will come to force, that's, what, that's the moment where we will be jumping in a quantum, you could say. So ecosystem of players, you all out there. It's a challenge to decarbonize, but I'm pretty sure you have ideas how you would start it. And in that sense, as I said, this is your mission now. I just handed it over to you to assess your business performance with some new lenses and new mindsets. And also curious, of course, I am curious how you are going to measure uh, within your business environment. And absolutely happy to be in touch. Uh, I encourage you to, to, you know, to do that later on as well because it's, it's a joint effort and it's not only within a company, it's actually a joint effort for all of us to do. And I uh, left some time for questions. So uh, Fleur, I will just, uh, Fran, sorry, I will just uh, hand it back to you and see if there's anything that I can answer there is out there. And I will uh, see my screen. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much, Anna Maria, for sharing the vision of IKEA on sustainability. Um, one question, uh, obviously uh, IKEA has a lot of uh, loyalty cards, data, uh, e-commerce data. Mm -hmm. In terms of other external data points, what else do you typically use across mm -hmm. the business or can you share? Yes. Uh, of course, the difficulty about this is how it's measured globally, how far you can go from global to local when you are reaching into these data sets. Um, we have a few vendors whom we are actually purchasing the localized data. And of course, this is the moment you need someone who helps you because this is such a specific area that you need to bring in specific knowledge about emission factors, um, the local local circumstances inside cities. Um, I think the public accessible data that municipalities and governments gather is one of the source that is really needed and really helpful. Um, there's quite a lot of entities, NGOs as well, uh, who are tracking global footprint for activities, vehicles itself. Um, the International Energy Agency itself has a huge database that everyone can tap into, of course, with a certain fee attached. Um, I think this is the moment where I need to say that there's a lot of work we rely on on our colleagues in the countries who are familiar with the context and they are familiar with the key areas where we started acting on really heavily uh, key cities as, as we selected a few connected to the C C40, I think the Cities 40 initiative itself that we really started gathering data on markets not only on business units that we are tracking around because the ecosystem around them is more important as than the unit itself. So public sources, municipality sources, government sources. And I think the point where it's interesting is when we start sharing knowledge between companies, which is not officially happening yet, it's difficult to, you know, to source information from each other, to learn about each other in that sense. And I hope I can encourage more collaboration for that on that field. Awesome. Um, and Anna-Marie, in terms of uh, data scientists within IKEA, obviously many of the people joining this event uh, mm -hmm. are data scientists. And um, what, How much has that team grown within IKEA and how many of them are in spatial? We have quite a lot of team who is working. Uh, well, let's say teams because there are multiple chapters. Um, I would say it's difficult to even assess how many people because it grows so fast. <laughs> Uh, I think the moment where it's interesting is how many of them go into spatial because we, of course, we have a lot of them working on apps, on solutions, on communication, um, algorithm driven, uh, you know, interaction with our customers. The point where spatial became really, really important is the customer fulfillment team, which is, I would say, around 30 people who is really tightly connected on a global level. And of course, every country has their own specialists who are breaking that down to local environment. I'm pretty sure I'm talking about the really core team here. 
because of course there are many more hundreds of people working on these topics, but the ones who are really the nerds, like you could say, working with spatial analysis is around the 30 on a global scale. And considering the volume of people and the volume of uh, products that we are moving around, you could say in a ratio wise, it's quite small, but I think this is where we are trying to democratizing the solutions to open a field for our colleagues locally and not only um, the ones I know of. Fantastic. Well, then, um, thank you so much for sharing the story, Anna Maria. Um, if anybody thank you wants very much. To with any questions, please feel free to do so on the chat or to reach out to Anna Maria. But uh, it's been great to have you here. And uh, have a great rest of the week.